and here we are. Welcome back to the Richard Sophomore, where we never sit out. We're your hosts, MDNC. What's going on today? This is just a little get to know, you know. Hopefully, we're going to do multiple parts of this, but we just want to talk about eight guys. I mean, look, what is get to know? All right, that's the first thing you got to ask, and I have an answer. Get to know is we're just going to highlight some players that, you know, maybe you heard of, maybe you hadn't heard of. I mean, we're going to talk about Jack Sawyer today, right? If you are an avid college football fan, you probably should have heard him, right? Probably should have heard of him, right? But that's a guy that still, we still want to talk about, you know, among other guys. And maybe some guys that you forgot about that got injured, maybe some guys moving up uh, from FCS to uh, Division One football, uh, some true freshmen last year that are on the rise, some transfers. I mean, we got everything in here. Um, and look, if we didn't get to talk about your player, your sleeper, your guy, let us know in the comments. All right, maybe we'll get around to it. All right, we still got plenty of time. Well, I mean, I say plenty of time, but I believe uh, we have like less than 80 days until college football season starts. As we're recording this on June 12th, let's freaking go. Let's freaking go. All right, I mean, let's let's go. I cannot wait. I, I mean, we're, we're almost there. Guys, keep pushing through. We just want to give some love, like Mike Matthews said, to these players, some props to them because, you know, they're going to be some impact players for their teams. And maybe they don't get the love they deserve nationally. But speaking of giving love, make sure you give your love as well to us. Like and subscribe. That does so much for our channel. We are growing. We are pushing. We are working hard um, in this offseason. And we really appreciate the support from everybody. Hit that like, hit that subscribe, share to another college football fan that you know would love this content as well. Um, it means the world. It means the world to us. So thank you for that. I see what you did there. That was slick. That was smooth. Not too yeah, bad. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a bump on everything that CD said right there. So yeah, I, I say we just kind of get right into this. Uh, short intro today. Look, the first guy that we want to talk about today. Okay. His name is Javon Jackson. And yes, if you watch our running backs video, our running backs draft, Please go check that out. All right. I will spoil something, though. One of us got Javon Jackson, and the other was pissed. All right. The other was pissed. And, you know, uh, I'll leave it up to y'all to, to figure out who got who. But the reality is Javon Jackson is a freaking stud player from UTEP. Okay. What do we have at new UTEP? We got a brand new stinking coaching staff in there. And, boy... Am I way higher on Scotty Walden than I probably should be? Way higher. Why am I higher than Scotty Walden? Well, he coached Austin P, the governors of Austin P, or PA, however you say that. I'm pretty sure it's just P. And uh, look, he runs a spread option. His offenses have been unbelievable, right? He is an insanely young coach. When he was coaching at East Texas Baptist, it was actually believed that he was the youngest head football coach in all of college football at the time, he was 26 years old, okay? He went over to Southern Miss to be a wide receivers coach uh, and co-offensive coordinator. He was even the interim head coach for Southern Miss for a period of time. Um, then he went over and got head hired at Austin P to be the head coach there. Freaking killed it. And now UTEP is bringing him in. And you know what I've said about schools like UTEP? Especially UTEP because their geography, like, I know it's in Texas, but it it, it kind of is the worst part of texas say you could be in you got to get someone that is either going to be uh, a well-known high school coach right someone like uh, joey mcguire that's got connections everywhere or you got to be a guy who's an innovator on offense and i think they got a guy that does that you know javon jackson himself is five foot eight 200 pounds you know he's from alabama fantastic running back in terms of just low balance point He's slipping through holes. He's breaking tackles. I freaking love this guy. I freaking love this guy. I'm going to let you talk about him a little bit, though. He is awesome. He was part of those record-setting uh, offenses for um, Scotty Waldron and the governors of Austin Peay. Off of 252 attempts, he had 1,300 yards, 10 touchdowns. He had a 57-yard run, which you guys will see here on that video. Thanks to our producer there, Matthew. I mean, it pretty special. Th this guy has got the juice. He, yeah, I mean... He, we love it in high school, right? Running back, wide receiver, quarterback, linebacker, kick returner, everything you want. I don't know why that just hit thumbs up there. If you saw that, 
whatever, whatever. Um, I hit the like button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's crazy. Um, we just run with it though. But yeah, he's had a really nice spring too, adjusting to FCS to D1. And I mean, this is USA, but it's still going to be an, an uptick in talent level. And I think him and Scotty Walder, his head coach who brought him over there, um, I think they're both getting used to it. And it sounds like he had a really nice spring and scrimmage um, running in between the tackles, even going outside, uh, ran with a lot of intensity. And I think that's something that they're going to really lean on this year. First year head coach, you need to be able to run the football. And I think uh, Waldron understands that. And like we said, Javon Jackson, part of the appeal fantasy wise was you saw his production in Scotty Waldron's offense. You've seen what he can do. And and the talent that he has, I believe it's going to pr- produce and translate in the CUSA. And uh, obviously, you know, for UTEP, that's a pretty good sign for them. Yeah, and I didn't mean to make this about Scotty Walden, right? Javon Jackson, we're trying to highlight him, right, because he is a fantastic football player. But the reason why we're also so high on him, like, like you talked about, look, the history of Scotty Walden, if you haven't watched our video on Scotty Walden, I really encourage you to go back in the archives and watch it when he first got hired, okay? He played quarterback at three different colleges, right? Lower level schools, but three different colleges, right? So he saw all those different offenses right away out of college. He got hired to be a coach. Um, and he's just been, he hasn't looked back ever since. And there's also a guy that we're going to talk about later, uh, by the name of Buster Faulkner that he coached with at Southern Miss. So he's just had the ability to like learn a lot really early and he's just had success. And yeah, we know he loves to run the football. We know he does. And Javon Jackson, um, I think you found this little nugget here that Javon Jackson is already dazzling coaches on in the spring early, you know, and yeah, he's a transfer and we're like, oh, is it, is it going to translate, you know, to the next level? I, I think five foot eight, 200 pounds is a great build for a running back. You know, he's durable. He's thick, but he's also small enough. He's going to, he's got good contact balance. He's going to slip through holes. Like I already said, he's a fantastic running back and you're going to see him break tackles. You're going to see him have patience. Um, They ran, uh, Brody knows ball does, good stuff on YouTube. If you haven't watched every single game that he's ever posted, which I wouldn't have expected you to, but you can go back and watch, you know, uh, the Chattanooga game and a few other games that he played in. And you can just see the patience. Uh, You can just see his vision and his patience that he has. And yeah, sure. UTEP is playing (laughs) with an offense entirely made of transfers, not just like new transfers from this year, but like last year's and year before transfers. It (laughs) basically every single player on UTEP's offense will have started at a different school that was not UTEP before they got here. So we'll see actually like kind of how that all fits together and kind of a nice uh, yet another uh, case file of uh, or case study of, you know, what the transfer portal can do to some of these teams. So it'll be interesting to see what Javon Jackson does uh, this season, which both you and I expect him to be pretty awesome. Yeah, and real quick, touched on the schedule that he's got there. Um, they start off with Nebraska, right, in Lincoln. That's going to be pretty tough. I won't lie. We've done a lot of talk about Nebraska defense, specifically that D-line. It's going to give everybody headaches, and no exception is UTEP. Um, and they're playing at home once in the, the month of September, or I guess August and September, right? So that that's not ideal for an all-new offensive transfers, a new coaching staff, blah, blah, blah. Javon Jackson trying to transfer over to, you know, uh, FBS level, but it's kind of been thrown in the fire right away. I do think they have a bye week, the end of September, starting in October. You get into he- the QSA play, and I think there's going to be some real opportunities for him to put up numbers. You're going to have these midweek, like Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday games in prime time. You're going to be like, who's this kid? This little short guy from UTEP. But, oh, look at him go, and it's going to be pretty exciting. So we're telling you now. We're telling you, get to know him now so you're not surprised come this fall. Yeah, I would say as a Nebraska fan, I wouldn't be overly worried, you know, because your defensive line is really good. I'm sure that it's going to handle that UTEP offensive line. But look, if you happen to be tuning into that UTEP uh, Western Kentucky game on October 10th or uh, tuning in for that, uh, I guess not the Tennessee, but the New Mexico State game on Thanksgiving weekend, that's going to be an awesome one at 3 p.m. there. Definitely a watch. Definitely a watch. Are they playing week zero? No, they're not. They're playing nope. week one. Labor Day so, weekend. They did last year, I'm pretty sure. And they lost. 
Oh, that was so brutal. That was the Jack State, right? That was, well, that was yeah. just the end of, I forget UTEP's coach, but that was tough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the, what's the name? Who's the, who's the gunslinger quarterback there that uh just, I don't he let me down. He let me down. I don't even talk about so it. So bad. I had UTEP like minus two. It was, it was such a bummer. I thought it was such a lock, but whatever. Anyways, uh, let's move on. Let's talk about Eric Singleton Jr. from Georgia Tech. He is a wide receiver. He was a true freshman. Yeah, he's not like a physical specimen in terms of like he's not 6'5", 240 pounds, and runs a 4'3", like Calvin Johnson did at Georgia Tech. This guy, 5'11", 173 pounds. He's a true sophomore, but he plays bigger than he is. He high points the football. All right. He's not a terrible run blocker. He ran a 10 6 at the 100 meter dash in high school. He's just really good. He was kind of a late bloomer in high school. You know, he, he was originally committed to the Hilltoppers and uh, Tyson Elton there over at Western Kentucky. But at the end, like mid season, he just he was fielding offers from, you know, all these big time schools late in the cycle. And I think, uh, look, he's from Georgia and Georgia Tech offered him a little bit late. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to stay kind of close to home. And turns out he had an opportunity right away. Now, I believe the first two weeks he did not start, but then I believe he started in every other game that he played in uh, that season. So in 12 games, 48 receptions, 714 yards, which was ninth in the ACC, by the way, which is pretty good for playing 12 games and not starting for your first two games. Six touchdowns, led the team in all those categories. He also had 30 receptions for a first down, right, which is nuts. So 30 out of his 48 receptions were for a first down crazy he also not only led his team in receptions but also the average depth of target you know that that's not even telling me like like you are an effective receiver in general like you're getting the football and you're making catches and you're getting open it also is telling me you're getting open down the field so yeah but they also ran some screenplays for him as well like they, they tried to scheme him up a little bit some jet sweeps of course but eric singleton is just a good football player man and that was buster faulkner's first year as offensive coordinator at georgia tech i mean could not have been happier with his performance as offensive coordinator. So him and Singleton going into year two together uh, could be pretty awesome, man. It could be pretty awesome. How are you feeling about Eric Singleton? This was a name that you put on here. So you must be excited about Eric Singleton. I love him. I, I was just uber pressed from the get go or week one. It was that, that, that uh, was a Friday night. They were playing Louisville and he just, he just made plays down the stretch. He kind of brought him back into that game um yeah he's a he's a really good player and you just saw him getting better better yes he had his freshman moments you saw the georgia game he had some drops right whatever like he was playing georgia they depended on him a which, lot. which by the way he still season. had a great game overall like statistically yeah, yeah or that, maybe, that. maybe i'm thinking about clemson I, i'm thinking about clemson well it was clemson georgia in the, Tech, in the but... georgia game he had that i mean it's going to be shown here he had a pretty fantastic touchdown uh mm -hmm. or sorry a long reception I believe he also had a touchdown in that game at least. Um, Eric Singleton was really good. But, yeah, I get what you're saying, though. Yeah, yeah, I think he had four drops in the year. It was like a 6% drop rate, which is not as bad as some other guys, you know? No. He's only a and, true freshman. Yeah. I, I Pretty exciting. And you bring back Haynes King, right? Dante Smith comes back. Rutherford comes back. Chase Lane's an old guy in there, right? And like, you've got talent in that room. And, and I think another year with all those guys meshing together, they kind of threw Singleton out there like – as your number one option. And and was he ready for it? Yeah, I think so. But it also, like, you saw some lumps, like I was talking about, I think year two, again, like we said, we, we talked about this list. When we opened this, this show, you're going to know some of these names, right? If you're a college diehard, you're going to know, like, oh, Eric Singleton, that's a good player down in, in Atlanta there for the Yellow Jackets in the ACC. You know, he's, I think this, another year is going to have a, a nice big step for them uh, this year. And Georgia Tech, I mean, their schedule is brutal. We talked about it. We have talked yeah. about it. It is brutal. Yeah. And it's it's thing. I mean, that's what happens when you get Clemson, Georgia every year, right? So we'll yeah. see how it goes. But regardless, I, I do think for them, he's gonna have to come up big. And it starts week zero, right? I believe they get Florida State, which is crazy. Yeah. Although ready for this though, like three of these kind of bigger games are at home. So it'll be interesting. Florida State, you get off the bat at home. That's a well, that's zero neutral site. Oh no, no, that that's Ireland, right? That's, that's what that's what makes it so hard is that's neutral site, Notre Dame's that, neutral site. Wait, that's in Ireland, right? Is that the Ireland game? I, I believe so. I'll double check that here real quick. Gosh, we're gonna look like idiots. But anyways, yeah, no, Dublin. That's the Dublin game. 
So I guess you get a home game against Notre Dame, you get a home game against Miami, you get a home game against NC State, who, by the way, is going to be good this year, uh, believe it or not. Uh, but yeah, you, you play Syracuse on the road, which is like going to be a good team. Louisville on the road. UNC is on the road. I mean, we'll see how that goes. Virginia Tech on the road and Blacksburg. And by that time, Virginia Tech might be rolling. And that stadium could be packed. So, yeah, Georgia. Oh, man. Yeah, that's that such a brutal schedule. But that doesn't mean that Eric Singleton can't shine. No. And he's going to have to. Yeah. Moreover, like he's going to have to. Your best players have to come up in these big games. And yeah, yeah. I hope that Georgia Tech fans don't turn on Brent Key this early because like last year's season was I thought was remarkable. And like just because you don't win as many as you did last year does not mean that Georgia Tech is a bad team. No, if they made a bowl not... game with their schedule, oh my gosh, that would be that'd be crazy. Because I mean, yeah, sure, you're chalking up wins against Georgia State and VMI, maybe Duke. First year, yeah, we'll, we'll see Manny how Duke is. Yeah, we'll see. You know, you get him at home. That's it. You've you've two kind of chalked up wins, and then a third maybe, and then after that, it, every game is like you're not you're not going to be favored in any of these games. I mean, down the season, we'll see how good Georgia Tech is and what the power ratings rate them as. But you are not you're going to be favored in likely three games, four games this year. So we'll, we'll see uh, if they can do it where they can make it to a bowl game, but. Good luck to Georgia Tech and good luck to Eric Singleton Jr., you know. But uh, we know he's going to have a good year. We know he's going to have a good year. Let's move on. Let's talk about – let's stay in the ACC. Let's talk about Virginia Tech's and the East Pebbles. Nope, not Dukes and the East Pebbles. Virginia Tech's. That's right. He's transferring, as did a couple of those defensive linemen out of there. I believe Dwayne Carter, he went to the NFL. Am I correct in that? Yes. And then R.J. Obens over at Notre Dame. So – but the, yeah, sure. RJ Oben's a name, right? Dwayne Carter's a name. Aeneas Pebbles should be a name. Man. He was unbelievable last year. He was really, really good. He was. I, that, this was this like this went way too under the radar, and we've talked about this a little bit. Yes. This, this, season. this went yes. way too under the radar for a team, by the way, Virginia Tech, who's like a couple pieces away with bringing back all that talent back that they had from another step up, right, from Brent Pry, And now you get got his Pebbles on top of that to be in that interior of the D-line. Who you're going to need that in this conference here in the ACC. And you, your parent, yes, he's not the biggest dude. He's not going to, you know, be an elite run stopper for you. But against the pass rush, him and Antoine Powell Ryland, like those, him coming off the edge. And then you got Fuga coming, stuff in the middle. I, It is awesome. I mean, what... What they did, they, they identified a need and they identified a person that they wanted to fit their scheme and whatnot. And yeah, it's an, it's a awesome. He, he's got nice twitch, real nice twitch. And he can use that twitch and that leverage. He's 6'1". He's pretty short, right? But he's got a good get off. He can use that in the run game, shoot some gaps. But I mean, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work. But regardless, so I, I still think he's an impact player for you. All right. Stop me when you hear a really good offensive line that he's going to be playing against. Vanderbilt, Marshall, Old Dominion, Rutgers, Boston College, Duke, Virginia, Syracuse. I mean, look, there's a couple of decent ones in there, right? But, like, the point is, is that this schedule, and we've talked about this with Virginia Tech so many times, their schedule is very favorable this year. And it's even more favorable for Indias Pebbles, or Peebles, to absolutely – freaking pop off i can't wait i can't wait yeah and they just got curtis perry from alabama too as a young guy uh pebbles can kind of help with that development as well but they don't need him to play right now because peebles and um copeland and, and fuga those guys like they've done a really good job right they've done a really good job it's uh it's exciting like you said oh man i i absolutely agree we, yeah, we also um, want to talk about it's not just like D line and like these guys make plays. Like you're not gonna like hear them on these like talk shows or yada 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 preview magazines. But these come October, come November, people's is gonna make some plays for Vod, for Virginia Tech. Sorry about that. Yeah, not Vod Tech. Come on, absolutely not. Yeah, uh, what is it? VTI would have been acceptable. Absolutely, Virginia Tech would have been acceptable. We don't yeah. say Vod Tech here. 
anymore. And it, here's <laughs> the thing too, like he could come back and I mean he had five sacks last year, which is a lot for defense interior defensive lineman, right? On a pretty productive um defensive front last year for Duke. I mean, five sacks again is not a disappointment at all. That that'd be really, really nice boost for this defensive line. Yeah, was he was he first team all ACC, I believe? Yeah. Stud. Something like he Stud. was also the spring tech spring football MVP for for Virginia Tech. Excuse me, spring football MVP. He got there right there in winter. Showed up, took care of business. Graduate transfer. Like this is his last year. He wants to cash in. He wants to play for an ACC title. He wants to go to the NFL draft. Like it, it was yeah. him and him and Byron Murphy were like the two highest graded, you know, pass rushing DTs. And if you know anything about our show, you know how much we loved Byron Murphy last year. And he was first round pick this year, the Seahawks. And um, yeah, and not that he's going to have that kind of rise or that kind of impact, you know, in, in terms of just like taking over games, leading into the playoffs and whatnot. But I, regardless, I, I still think it's pretty telling about PFF has him up there, right there with Byron Murphy. Yeah. It's similar to build to Byron Murphy too, by the way, which you don't have to be a gigantic human specimen to do wreckage in the interior. All right. six one two ninety. I mean, say he gets to 300. I mean, that that's like small-ish, I guess. But like, he can still cause havoc. Byron Murphy did it. Aaron Donald did it, right? Like, you just got to be a talented athlete with good hands, good feet, great first step, and some power. And uh, I think Aeneas Pebbles has got a lot of that, you know. Certainly room for improvement, though. But And we're going to see it this year. We're going to see it 100%. Let's move on. Let's talk about Jack Sawyer from Ohio State. And I'm sure college football fans in general know who Jack Sawyer is if you watched an Ohio State game or two. However, it's been a slow buildup for Jack Sawyer, right? For a guy that was insanely highly talented as a or, uh, highly sought after as a recruit, you know, you thought that right away he was going to become an impact player. And I think it just took a little bit of time. It took a little bit of time, but. He's a really good football player. I know that you like him a lot as a football player, and you know you expect him to go to the NFL after this season. And uh, but yeah, give me your give me your rundown on Jack Sawyer. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, you talk about that slow buildup, but like you said, he was a top five player consensus nationally, right? Of his class, his comps were Nick Bosa, right? Coming out of Ohio, like that, that's gonna have certain stigma and and, and expectations for you at Ohio State in year one and year two. He saw a little bit more improvement in year two for sure, right? But he's also playing behind a pretty darn good D-line as well there. And he kind of put it all together last year. We talked about Ohio State defense in the preseason. We were like, Jack Sawyer has to take that step. He is the guy that's going to take this defense and and elevate them to the next level, which we saw. We saw both those things happen. And I mean, yes, he only had it six and a half sacks, which is pretty damn good. It led the whole team in sacks, uh, 10 tackles for loss, two forced fumbles, three quarterback hurries as well. He's not like – he's a really good athlete, right? I'm not going to take that away from him, but it's not like he's just like just crazy, twitched up, bendy, you know, everything else and just going to dominate the combine and whatnot. But he just plays with a ton of power and and production. I, I don't know what – he's just in the right spot. He's never, you know, out leveraged or, or going to be in a bad spot against the run. He's super consistent against the pass. And his bull rush and his power moves is really, really nice and – um yeah, I mean, PFF had him the only edge in FBS to have, you know, 85 plus grades in pass rush and run defense, which is super, super impressive to see him do both of that, right? And yeah, I, I think um, JTT and, you know, others, Michael Hall, last year we loved, got a lot of attention and deservingly so. Very good players himself, but Sawyer, in my opinion, um, is a guy I wanted to highlight because. Um, I think he deserves more, a little bit more hype and and talk. And I also think he's going to take another step this year as well. And maybe we'll see him just be an alpha dominant uh, defensive end here in the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, it's also just another piece on that defense that's coming back. You know, like that that whole defense, it benefits Jack Sawyer that he's playing with a pretty incredible, talented incredibly talented group around them, you know, both in the secondary linebacker core, the defensive line. I mean, Jack Sawyer 
he's not the 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 star. I mean, he could be the star on this defense next year, but I think there's a lot of attention going in other directions on this defense, right? And we just wanted to give him, you know, his props and kind of highlight him a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Any other thoughts on Jack Sawyer? I mean, other than the fact that he's a monster and he's insanely well-rounded and, you know, he can kind of do everything. Well, yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of those guys coming back and uh, credit Larry Johnson and Ryan Day, whoever else, or maybe it was the players as well that convinced these guys to come back for their senior season or their fifth year, sixth year, whatever it may be. I mean, we talked about JTT. So you got Tyleek Williams coming back, right? Ty Hamilton coming back. You've got three other DTs that they really like there behind those guys. And yeah, it's it's, it's pretty awesome. Caden Curry, Kenyatta Jackson behind, you know, your defensive ends. It's um it's it's crazy. It is it is an embarrassment of riches that they have built up there all across their roster, especially in that D-line group. And in my opinion, the one I'm looking forward to the most. And and the one I'm excited to talk about and the one I like is Jack Sawyer. I I I'm really high on Jack Sawyer this year. Um, we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll be proved wrong, but I I just his floor is way too high, and I think he's still got some untapped ceiling that Larry Johnson can pluck out of him. Let's move on. On that note, let's talk about Xavier Mwankba for Iowa play safety and you know what last year was his first year starting and we both talked about it right and i remember this now i will preview from last year we talked about okay they they got a new safety in there all right like what's what's going to be the deal with this guy right we knew that he was highly recruited right why hasn't he been playing if he has all this talent right but i think we're both high on him we're like yeah like the reality is phil parker is so freaking good at his job that he's going to get Xavier Wakba with that talent. Like, he can't mess this up, right? There's no yeah. way. Well, I mean, turns out Wakba was absolutely a monster this year for them on a defense that was, I mean, yes, loaded in talent, but also I think there were already high expectations for Iowa heading in next year defensively. But I, I, dare I say they exceeded those expectations? You know, they at least met them for sure. For how high well, the, I mean, it, it was fantastic, and it, it was hugely in part to Xavier Wampa. Well, it was more so, too, just, I mean, how bad that offense was. Like, even, like, it was it bottomed out worse than we thought there was. We did not, we thought there was a floor on this offense for Iowa, and there was not. It just kept falling, and, and you look at that Nebraska game, like, you know, the Illinois game, even the Minnesota game, they, they should have they should have probably won um that Northwestern game, they somehow won. Like, it's a, I, oh, they somehow won, somehow won. But it's that defense. And Nuanka, I'm sorry, Nuanka and uh, Quinn Schultz back there as a safety duo is, is tremendous. I, I I love that duo there because Schultz, your free safety, is going to be in the right spot, not going to get beat deep. But Nuanka can be that athlete, can be that guy that's rangy and physical and instinctive and just fly around the field and make plays that up at the line of scrimmage past breakups he's really good in man um which is just really impressive obviously for a young safety as well i i, I do think there's going to be a jump here in year three again I, or at least like if you maintain or that upward trajectory that he's on right now you're gonna have some nfl scouts just drooling over his tape and, and his potential there yeah he's nuts i mean was he, he was he was he actually a five star coming out of high school? I thought he was a four star. Yeah, he was a five star. I mean, twenty four seven had him a five star. He was top safety, obviously number one player in Iowa. He it was a massive, massive recruiting. It was like down to your know, official visits went to Notre Dame, A and M, Ohio State, and then Iowa got one. And then literally a week before signing day, he committed to Iowa, and they hung on to him and he enrolled early. And obviously, the rest is history for them. But that's again, that was big time in-state win for them and it's awesome that's paid out for for him and and for the iowa hawkeyes as well yeah i mean just looking at his stats here i mean like it's not like the the numbers pop off right if you look at the the box score stats you're like oh we only had one interception and two pass breakups nah he was everywhere folks he was everywhere uh yeah. impacting you know a lot more ways than just you know with his ball skills you know yeah, I would, I would also um, – I do think I'm interested. Like, you, you lost Cooper DeGene, right? And and he had a lot of flexibility there with, with Castro and obviously the two safety duos. You you had a ton that you could do with Phil Parker and the defensive staff. 
Um, I do think like I'm not gonna say he's gonna have that like impact that DeGene had because obviously DeGene was special teams and you know, if they tried him on offense, like he was is obviously like game change, game breaking, like all American stuff. I'm not gonna put that expectation on um Nuankpa, but I do think that his athleticism, his instincts, like he's gonna allow you to do things. And maybe in year two starting, you could see um them start to test out the limits and what he can do and how much trouble he can give opposing offense coordinators and quarterbacks. I mean, you look at their schedule they play. I mean, you got to play Iowa State, right? And you know they're going to throw the ball. You know they're going to do some things. You get it at home, which is nice, obviously. But, yeah, you got some teams that um, could be slinging it this year. I mean, you're out of the Big Ten West, so you're going to have to play defense in that secondary and take some risks maybe and, and whatnot. So I do think uh, he's going to be a big-time player for them this year, which is not a hot take at all, obviously. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do want to also note the fact that – what is that? 838 snaps on the year, which is nuts. Just a testament to how much that defense was on the field. Yeah, right. 357 of those snaps were in the box. 235 of them were at free safety, and 243 of them were in the slot. You want to talk about versatility? I mean, there you have it. There you have it. Mm-hmm. So just looking at the – his pre-snap alignment, you you understand like the value that he has in this team and where he goes. I mean, I don't know, I don't know the the method to Phil Parker's madness, but it works. And if he values Xavier and Wonka enough to play him on all three of those positions quite frequently, actually pretty evenly for the most part, yeah. then I'm just gonna say he's a unbelievably versatile player that's ready to take another leap, like you were talking about. Let's talk about Keon Sapp at Alabama. Where was he before? He was at Michigan before. And what's interesting is that you had this national championship team, right, who had, I'm not going to say historic, but a freaking fantastic defense, right? I mean, it was historic in some ways. He didn't even start. He didn't even start for Michigan, but he was in that rotation. I believe he started in the national championship game, though, uh, if I'm correct in that. Yeah, I mean, he he played over 300 snaps. Like, he basically was a starter. Like, that secondary rotated in and out a ton. And Ken Sab was a big part of it. He was fantastic. I think he had 21 passes thrown in his direction. Only 10 of them were caught. You know, like, eight pass deflections or pass breakups in just those 21 attempts. That is crazy. Fantastic athlete. Bama knew exactly what they were getting when they were going after him, right? And you got some new pieces there in that Alabama secondary. But uh, Malachi Moore, Keon Sab. I mean, you still got some names there. I think Keon Sab's going to be a really good player. I mean, yeah, sure, he's got some things he's got to work on, but that I think more so comes from like a lack of, um, when I say lack of experience, I mean, I, I think it's just like this might be the year that he kind of takes off. So, look, if you're looking at Alabama's defense and the name Keon Sab isn't doing anything for you, uh, it should. Yeah, I mean, you you got you had Sanders still, you had Page, you had Rod Moore, you had uh, Wallace, obviously Will Johnson. Like that secondary was loaded, and then you get to a guy like Keon Sab, and he was just the young guy in an elite veteran group. I guess Will Johnson's also a young kid, but regardless, I, I think. That, like you said, that second there's a lot of new pieces, new coaching staff coming in. A great place to start is Malachi Moore coming back for what feels like year 20 there, but it's probably only year five. And Keon Sapp, like that's a, a great building block for you there. You bring in the new coaches. Obviously, Kane Womack going to be the defense coordinator, but you got Mo Linguist and Colin Hitchler, right? Two secondary guys that are just, holy cow, overqualified. Uh, Hitchler guy, obviously... You Midwest, Big Ten, Cincinnati fans are going to understand him and what he did for Cincinnati. Brian Cook, Kobe Bryant, not to mention Sauce Gardner. It was a 2020, 2020 season defense back coach of the year. Um, what he can do with Sab, and, and Sab's another guy. We talked about this with, with Nwang, right? Fantastic cover straights, can tackle really, really well, can play in the box, free safety, nickel. Michigan was really counting on him this year and unfortunately obviously for Michigan Harbaugh leaves and you got the kind of 
a couple of players ended up leaking out of there, and Sab was one of them. And DeBoer, all too familiar with him, with what he saw in that national championship game when he was at Washington. And he, he understands exactly the kind of player Sab is and the impact he can have um, in year one for his Bama team. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how Alabama is going to use him, but he had, I mean, he played some snaps in the slot. Um, he played some snaps over the top. I mean, that's mostly where he played. And he's played some snaps in the box. You know, he's got the frame to, you know, play in the box, you know, make an impact in that run game. But it, it has yet to be determined, I guess, what they're going to use him for exactly. I mean, he'll probably play strong safety, right? If I had to guess. Um, is Malachi Moore going to play free safety then? Damani Jackson, and then you got Devonta Smith in that star spot. What do you think? Oh, I think the the beauty of all three of those guys is I think you could feel good kind of rotating them and just being like, okay, who wants to line up here? Let's. It's like the old uh the old Bama the the rideouts right? They had uh those four stud receivers. They would literally rock paper scissors for what routes they ran. It's going to be like that. I think these guys not quite that scale, but. You can have a ton of versatility, a kind of ton of options there uh, that you feel pretty good about there at that back level of your your defense. Yeah, I'm looking at this roster, and it's a good roster still, man. No Nick Saban, it's still a freaking <laughs> good roster. People be I mean, sleeping, man. People be ben sleeping. Smith, Jaheim Otis, Tim Keenan, Quandarius Robertson. Dude, if you were to tell me right now, if you were to tell me right now that they stay relatively healthy. Oh. That defense, or are you talking about the whole team? The whole team, but it's just that secondary, right? That, those are young kids, and and like I guess we didn't even, we didn't talk about uh, you got the the freshman coming in, Zabian Brown, Red Morgan, Baller, Jalen, Drake Mc- Patrick Jr. Which by Drake the way, Patrick Jr. Holy cow! The fact that he's playing right now is nuts because we were watching. I mean, we're young guys. Okay, we're we're like young guys. We were born in the two thousands. If if that makes you uh, turn us off, right? Because you're like these guys don't know college football, then so be it. But all all I'm saying is that it is crazy to us that Drake Patrick's son is playing at Alabama right now. Nuts. Yeah, he, I still remember his hit. I believe it was at Arkansas. He he crushed somebody coming across a a little drag route across this field, and yeah, I. That's kind of wild. I mean, we'll, we'll hope, obviously, for Bama's sake, that he's um, at least somewhat near that level of player um, for these killing the board teams. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, back to back to Keon, Sam. All right. Well, well um, let me ask you this. What do you think Alabama's odds to win the national championship are on DraftKings right now? 1,200? That's pretty close. 1,400. Yeah. Do you think there's uh, value yeah. in that? No. Nope. No? no you don't think that... Dude, there's like 16 they're going to play how many how many games are going to play 16 70 like it's going to be a lot of games and you're going to have to have depth now i have depth at quarterback and some other positions that are kind of nice to have but regardless yeah, Keon the, Sab, the offensive line yeah Keon Sav i i mean he's uh he's a, he's a big guy for bama michigan fans yeah. devastated that's how you know that's how you know that's how yeah. it is. like michigan fans i trust oh they're devastated Keon Sav leaves Probably a good sign about uh, what Alabama, the type of player that they're getting. Yeah, I think uh, our boy Jason at Rock Boys Football, I think his quote was, yeah, Michigan fans know, and he's a Michigan guy. He's like, Michigan fans know that Bama got a good one. So, yeah. You can't take our word for it. Take his word for it. Former top 100 player. I mean, versatility. What, What don't you like? What don't you like there? What don't you like? Let's talk about Clay Webb. From Jacksonville State, <laughs> I know you were excited wow. to talk about him. I know you were very excited. To talk. How about how about Jacksonville State just collecting former highly rated recruits from Georgia? Yeah, how about that? Can, can uh, we talk about? There's two Cusa players on this list. That's how you know. That's how you know. Midweek, watch the old line, watch the run game. Yup, talking about Clay yeah. Webb here. I mean, what what they did this past season in 2023, Jack State was a just a an unstoppable train on the ground, right? Fifth best rushing offense in the nation, over 3,000 yards. I mean, you're talking about them in the service cadence, right? Andrew Paul coming in behind him. Anwar Lewis is coming back, right? Five different players ran for over 300 yards. Uh, Clay Webb, like you said, former Georgia guy, former five-star, coming, I believe out of Alabama, 
right? He was a massive recruiting win for Georgia. Mm-hmm. I believe, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he flipped um, from Alabama and he flipped to Georgia. Regardless, whatever it was, it was a big win for Georgia. Didn't quite work out there. Goes down to Ch- Jacksonville State and was absolutely dominant this year. I mean, I, I would not have been surprised to see his name in the portal with some tampering, but I think he was just happy where he was. And I think he could really rise up some draft boards, right? And and just also just be dominant for Jack State in the, the CUSA there. Yeah, I you know what I like? I, I don't I can't attest to like his first step, but I like his speed. Okay. Like I like it a lot. And when you're Rich Rodriguez, right, and Rod Smith over there. They run a very high tempo offense and, and you have to be in shape and you have to be fast and you have to move. I think Clay Webb does those things very well, right? I don't know if they run the the true spread option anymore there. Uh, I think they run kind of a bunch of different stuff, but it is very heavy in the run, right? And they're requiring a lot of guards to pull a lot. And I mean, if you're having Clay Webb pull over there, uh, and the CUSA just absolutely lighting up defensive linemen from Middle Tennessee State. I mean, they got a good one over there at Jacksonville State. So, um, yeah, so I'm encouraging you guys, if you guys are going to watch any CUSA football this year and you happen to be watching Jacksonville State, uh, watch out for Clay Webb. Watch out for Andrew Paul, the running back there. He also transferred from Florida. Clay Webb, number 74, by the way, plays left guard. Um, then Andrew Paul, I don't know what number he'll be this year, probably like number four or something, but either way, I mean, he was fantastic. I know you got more stuff to talk about with Cliff Clay Webb. Real quick, I do want to mention, let, let me get some name drops here. Back in his high school days, right, because we're spotlighting Clay Webb, right, five-star sure. guy coming out of Oxford, Alabama. He was recruited heavily. It was Georgia and Bama, like I said. He was never committed to Alabama, but he was heavily, heavily recruited. In state kid, they won him bad. Guess who the primary recruiters were? For Georgia and the Alabama at the time. For Georgia, Sam Dan Pittman. Oh. Sam Pittman, our fellow over in Arkansas there. And Alabama's Brent Key. Damn. Wow. That's pretty crazy. That's and guess pretty what? crazy. Georgia Tech's got a pretty dang good offensive line over there. Brent Key also recruited Evan Neal, Jedrick Wills, two first round picks there. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Obviously, Sam Pittman's just a boss hog. We love that for him, yeah. but uh, yeah, Clay. I mean, Webb, he's had Sam Pittman's had some good offensive lines in there in Arkansas, not yeah. recently. Well, they they just run the ball well. I mean, they, I mean, not last, <laughs> last year's year different, they, but they, last they just year's had, brutal. Part of his identity was running the ball. Regardless, though, quit Clay Webb. I mean, it was twenty twenty three National Offensive Guard of the Year. It's pretty exciting. I mean, for Jack State to hold on to the caliber of player he is, it's I, I for one, selfishly was like, good, eh, good for you guys. The Gamecocks down there. I, I mean, he's also from Alabama, and, and Jacksonville State's not from Jacksonville, Florida. Right? It's in Alabama, and I think that home home, home state also kind of helped there, proximity to home. Yeah, please stay healthy, Clay Webb, please. Yeah. I, 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 need, I need the highlights of you healing off and just lighting up some linebackers at the second level. I need that. I need that yeah. stuff. But yeah, just... Please, guys, if you're watching this, that means you are pretty hardcore. I'm assuming, I'm just going to assume that you're going to be watching CSA games. Please watch Jacksonville State this year. I am so excited for this team. I'm so excited. Anyways, uh, do you have anything else on him or you ready to move on? Ready to move on. All right. Let's talk about Luke Hass from Arkansas. Kid plays tight end. You're like, oh, I know who Luke has is. Well, some people don't. And here's why, because he got hurt, right? He was a true freshman last year. He was fantastic. He was fantastic in his first four games. He was already getting kind of superstar hype. Brock Bowers comparison. Well, like I believe on like his first or second catch against AM, breaks his collarbone. It's pretty brutal. Uh it was it wasn't like a nasty hit. It wasn't like a cheap hit. It just was like unfortunate. It was very clear, you know. Something happened, you know, but He's back, guys. He's back. He's so good. I mean, like, yeah, sure, he doesn't have, like, the gigantic monster size that some of his other guys has, but it's 6'3", 240 pounds, moving like he does. You know, I think he runs, like, a high 4'5", four, 4'6". Four, I mean, like, this is a pretty good athlete that they have over there at Arkansas. Pretty good athlete. 
Yeah, and he's a guy that kind of new to football, right? He he didn't pick it up until COVID. Actually, COVID was the reason why he COVID shut down. All he could do was work out. He started working up, put on some weight, and his twin brother was like, who also plays at Arkansas, was like, hey, why don't you come out and play football? And he was like, okay, whatever. And then all of a sudden he's a baller. And he had, you know, 70, 700 yards his sophomore year for a Bigsby, Oklahoma, which is a powerhouse in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and yeah, it hasn't stopped there. This is a big time recruiting win for Arkansas. I know, I believe he was originally committed or he wanted to go to Oklahoma. In state Oklahoma, Lincoln Riley left to go to USC. That obviously changed a lot of things for Ahaz. He took an OV to Bama, to Michigan, and, and Arkansas ended up, you know, he didn't stay committed to Arkansas all throughout official visit season. They pay and it paid off for him, I think. In year one, obviously, they got him on the field and they found him. People he just kind of got lost. And for a guy who's new to football, He's got such good zone feel uh, in that limited sample size, right? But he just kind of got lost in defenses. And, like, it's – I mean, I'm not going to compare to Brock Bowers, right? Because that's – Just four games of sample size. size. It, it's exactly. four games. And, and Brock Bowers was a tight end. He was a first-round first, first round pick, and obviously it is a different specimen, you know, from, from Georgia. But it's kind of crazy to see, like, some similarities there. Not just – not freak – not no freak. I mean, he's a really good athlete, right? But it's not like he's – Six seven, two eighty pounds. Doesn't have a forty five inch vertical. It's not like all these things, but he's just good zone feel, tough run after catch, a willing blocker. I mean, he's got to put on some weight and some strength and whatnot. He's a true freshman, right? New to football, but I mean, you can tell he wants to block, and obviously that matters for Sam Pittman and that offense there, who's going to want to run the football. Um, with J- uh, and Jackson coming, Taylor Green, and it sounds like um Haas or. Hot or has wow, has thank you, Luke has. It sounds like he's really optimistic about this offense with Taylor Green and Bobby Petrino. Um, I believe he's quoted to say this year's scheme is going to be even better for tight ends. And that was a guy that had 253 yards in just four games, so pretty damn impressive. Yeah, and I feel like Bobby Petrino has used tight ends pretty well, you know, in the past. I mean, Donovan Green got hurt last year for Texas AM, which was a huge blow. But, uh, I mean, a guy like Max Wright, I mean, he was able to kind of get the most out of him in in some ways. So, I, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's not even like you're using Luke Has, though, as like a true tight end. Like, you could put him in the slot, you know, like yeah. you can put him on the outside. Like, you could put him in a bunch of different spots. And if we know something about Bobby Petrino, it's that dude's pretty pretty creative. He's also creative with player personnel. So, I would imagine that we we see some really interesting looks with, looks with Luke Haas. Uh, this season for Arkansas. So definitely probably the player on Arkansas that I'm most excited about. I know you're super excited about Jake Quinton Jackson this year, but I'd say Luke has is probably the guy that I am most excited. Well, and Taylor green, obviously Taylor green stands <laughs> right over here, but yeah, uh, I gotta, I gotta, that's my guy. If you're going to make me pick one. It's Luke has that I'm excited about in this Arkansas roster. Well, yeah. And that, that's just that room in there. Ty Washington's there. Uh, Varquez Gomes, a guy that was just a year ago, was a pretty sought after transfer portal um, commit from North Texas. The guy was a freshman All American um, for the Mean Green down there. Yeah, like you said, like what they can do offensively, mixing and matching, playing inside outside. Uh, you got versatility there, and obviously that helps getting the best matchup for your playmakers like Luke Luke has. Yeah, absolutely. I w- will say, I mean, you guys. Looking at their schedule, they play A and M right uh, September twenty eighth, and obviously AT and T Stadium like that. That's obviously, obviously, unfortunately, got hurt last year. But that's gonna be a guy that like, if you're like, if you're A and M and you're opposing defense coordinators in the SEC, it's like, you got to make sure you know where he is at all times. Without without a doubt, without a doubt, and I already know that you know even four games in, you know, you're watching this film, and I know Texas A and M was. Uh, prepared to do what they could to stop um uh, stop Lucas stop number nine on offense so anyways thank you all for watching this episode of I mean get to know <laughs> get to know these players right uh I'm hoping that there'll be more of these if you guys really enjoy these then there will be more of these um if you guys have any ideas of some players that you want us to know or you want us to introduce to other people uh, please drop them in the comments or send us an email uh, at the redshirtsoftware@gmail.com. DM us on Twitter. 
at the Red Shirt Soft. Look, you can contact us in a bunch of ways, but the easiest thing to do if you're watching on YouTube, just put it in the comments. And if you're listening on Spotify, you can do any one of those other things. So uh, we still love you, our Spotify listeners. We still love you. I know there's a couple of you out there. I mean, literally just a handful. <laughs> but we love you guys too. Uh, but yeah, so make sure if you like the content, like the video, subscribe, do all the shenanigans. We appreciate you guys. Let's get excited. Let's get excited, man. I mean, we got about probably nine to ten more episodes of these podcasts before we get into our conference breakdowns, and you do not want to miss those. You do not want to miss those. We nailed our previews last year, and you want to be there for those. So make sure you're subscribed now and tuning in for those. Yeah, you heard the man. You heard the man. What yeah. What else is there to say? And by the way, if you're watching right now, you're awesome. Thank you so much. But uh, yeah. All right. We'll see y'all in the next one.